I received a couple of questions about getting the most out of your Bible study. So I want to tell you how you can get the most out of your Bible study. What are some things you need to look for and look at and be conscious of when you're studying and reading the Bible? The first thing is you need to find Jesus on every page. Jesus said in John 5, 39 through, well, John 5, 39 and a couple other verses I'll show you in John 5. But first look at John 5, 39. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. When Jesus said this, uh, all he had was the Old Testament. So, he's saying the Old Testament testifies of himself. You know, he didn't have the Gospels and Pauline epistles yet. So, Jesus Christ is in the Old Testament. Then go on down to verse 46 and 47. He said, For had you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if you believe not his writings, how shall you believe my words? So Jesus Christ said himself that Moses wrote of him. And if you want your Bible to really come alive for you, then you need to look for Jesus Christ on every page of the Old Testament. He's there as the angel of the Lord, and he's there in types and in pictures. He's there in prophecies. You see shadows of Jesus Christ when a Adam died to get his bride, just like Jesus died to get his bride. You see Jesus when the ark had just one door, because Jesus is our one door. You see Jesus when Abraham sacrificed his son whom he loved, just like the father sacrificed the son. Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, was buried and resurrected. You see Jesus when Joseph was in the pit with no water, just like Jesus Christ went into the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. You see Jesus when Joshua gets Israel into the promised land. The law couldn't get us into the promised land. Moses couldn't get Israel into the promised land. Joshua got them in. The promised land pictures uh, you getting saved and trying to live that victorious Christian life. Uh, when David said, they pierced my hands and my feet, that points towards the Lord Jesus. When Solomon reigned in perfect peace, that pictures Jesus Christ in the millennial reign. Jesus Christ is all over the Old Testament. It's hard not to see him once you see him. What I'm doing is right now is I'm going through the Old Testament and highlighting in red when I see a verse that points to Jesus Christ. Because not only are we looking for him in the rapture, but we're just we're just looking for him in everything. In Titus 2.13, it says, Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm looking for him to where he shows up in the Old Testament as well. We're supposed to be looking for him. So you should get your pen, get your highlighter, search him out in the Old Testament, become a spiritual search engine. Study so much on the types that if someone asks you a question about a verse, you can point it directly to Jesus Christ. So the first thing you want to do to get the most out of your Bible study is find Jesus in everything about the Bible. Find him in the Old Testament. Find him in the New Testament. Find some way that you can point it to Jesus. It's really going to make the Bible come alive because it's the written word about the living word who's alive. He didn't stay dead. He's alive forevermore. The next thing you want to do is acknowledge the three applications. Each part of your Bible has at least three applications, historical, doctrinal, and practical. Sometimes the practical is called devotional or inspirational. And sometimes the doctrinal is referred to as the prophetical. Because a lot of the doctrinal stuff has to do with something of prophecy. But the Bible says in 2 Timothy 3.16, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So all the Bible... It's profitable to us in many ways. Romans 15.4 says, 
For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. So the things you see written in the Old Testament, the things written aforetime, is for our learning. It's profitable for us. We can get practical application, at least, out of it. In 1 Corinthians 10, 11, now all these things happen unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. So the Old Testament, the things back there are our admonition. The stories you read in the Old Testament happened sometime in history, meaning what you read is a real thing that took place in history. It's not some just made up fairy tale. And if you're if you're reading them and only acknowledging the story and what took place in history, then you are simply just focusing on the historical application. For example, there was literally a man named Jonah who ran from God and who was swallowed by a whale. That literally took place in history. That's the historical application. It really happened when it happened, just like it said it happened. So that's the historical application, and that's one way to read it, and I enjoy that. Now, how do, how do you get the devotional, practical, inspirational aspect out of that? Well, when I read about Jonah running from God and being swallowed by a whale, I can say that I personally need to do what God wants me to do and not run from God so that he doesn't send something like a whale in my life to eat me up. You can always get some type of practical application out of reading the history of the Old Testament saints. David killed a giant. That is history. Practically, I can face the giants in my life with God's help. That's looking at it as the, at the, as the devotional, inspirational, practical view. So what would be the doctrinal view of David versus Goliath? Well, we know it happened in history. That's historical. We know we can face giants with God's help in our life. That's the practical. Now, doctrinally, David killing Goliath pictures Jesus Christ versus the Antichrist. Goliath gets a head wound. The Antichrist gets a head wound. David says he's going to give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines to the fowls of the air in that story. Well, that's what happens to the Antichrist army. So you can look at the story of David versus Goliath, and you can see the uh, picture of something in the future. And you can go through the Psalms and read all kinds of stuff that's something David's talking about back then historically, but it also talks is representing something that's going to happen in the tribulation or the millennium or something about the Antichrist. That's why a lot of people refer to it as, as the prophetic view because uh, many times the, the doctrinal view is prophetic view. So you can see how you can look at every story and more than just seeing it as history. It's not just a history book. It's a prophecy book. And it's an instruction book. Uh, if you're just reading it, looking at the sto as the story that ha took place a long time ago, it might bore you after a while. I mean, I like reading it just the historical view, too. I mean, that's fun to me. But you can get something to use out of those stories in your everyday life devotionally. Put your name there. Put your name where Jonah is and say, well, I don't need to run from God. I need to do what God says the first time. That way God doesn't have to let something take place in my life to wake me up. Learn from everything and apply it to yourself in that sense. That way you can see it devotionally, you can see it doctrinally, and you can see it historically. Okay, so that's looking at it from the three applications. When you're reading the Bible, try to look at those three applications. The next thing is to look at the covenants. Throughout the Bible, God made covenants with man. And this is an agreement between him and man. For example, God told Adam to not eat 
off of a tree under the Edenic covenant. That was the agreement. Back before Adam and Eve sinned, they had one command, don't eat off of a tree. But that's not what he's telling me today. He doesn't tell me to abstain from eating off of a tree. There is no tree that I have to abstain from to keep my eternal life. And then he made another covenant with Adam after the fall. Under that covenant, they shed the blood of an animal. You know, Cain and Abel. Uh, Cain didn't bring the blood of an animal. He brought the fruit of the ground. Abel brought the uh, blood of an animal. See, we don't bring the blood of an animal today. I have the perfect blood sacrifice, and that's Jesus Christ. So that's done away with. I don't go by some things that's under that covenant. Some stuff I, I would go by, but not that. But God made a covenant with Noah. He made a covenant with Abraham. God made a covenant with Moses and David. And while we don't follow everything from those covenants, a lot of the parts of those covenants do overlap to today. But being aware of what covenant the people are under when you're reading certain scriptures in the Bible will explain a lot and keep you from getting confused. For example, in Genesis 9, he told Noah that Noah could eat any moving thing. But under the Mosaic Covenant, under the law, they couldn't eat just anything. Because God named some clean and unclean animals that they could and couldn't eat. Then today, after Jesus died on the cross, we're no longer under the law. That's a part of that Mosaic Covenant. And Paul once again says, Every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. <clears throat> so you see, the agreement that God has with us today is really clearly laid out in Paul's epistles. If you're looking for God's direct instruction for us today, you'll really find it laid out in the Pauline epistles. Now that's not to say that Paul's epistles is the only place that me and you can have doctrine for us today because there's doctrine for us all throughout the Bible. But if you really want to know what God's agreement with us today is about, read the Pauline epistles, and then everything you read in the rest of the Bible, filter it through the Pauline epistles. For example, God tells Israel to keep the Sabbath. He says it's a sign between him and Israel is keeping the Sabbath but in the New Testament, Paul says, Let no man judge you in meat, or in drink, or in respect of an holy day, or of the new moons, or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come. So you see, Paul comes back and gives you instruction for today that you don't have to keep the Sabbath. Whereas if you just took what Exodus said, you would think, Well, I'm supposed to be keeping the Sabbath. I better join the Seventh-day Adventist church or something. So you see... It's not, we're not saying that you just do away with the rest of the Bible and only take the Pauline epistles. We're saying to learn the Pauline epistles very well and then filter everything through the Pauline epistles. So a lot of people will just take the Pauline epistles as doctrine, but that's not right either because there's all, all through the Bible you can find stuff that you can take for yourself doctrinally that applies directly to you but you want to filter it through the Pauline epistles. And the way to know what's for you and what's not for you is if Paul is saying the same thing, then it's for you. If Paul's saying something different, it's for somebody else. Just like the Sabbath day example. You don't Paul uh Moses had him keep the Sabbath. Paul doesn't have you keep the Sabbath. It's not that it's contradicting each other. It's that Moses was talking to Israel under the law. Paul's talking to born-again believers in the New Testament, in the church age, born-again believers in the body of Christ. They're simply talking to two different people. There's no contradiction whatsoever there. You need to be very familiar with those Pauline epistles. And if you do that, you can use the Pauline epistles, filter everything you read through that, Figure out what God wants you to do in his covenant with you and his agreement with us today. So that's a big one. So first thing, find Jesus on every page. Second thing, 
acknowledge those three applications. Third thing, look at the covenants. And the next thing, recognize the different kingdoms. So you have read in the Bible where it refers to the kingdom of God. And you've read in the Bible where it refers to the kingdom of heaven. Now, a lot of, I know a lot of people believe these are the same kingdoms. And I know good preachers that believe these are the same kingdoms. And I, I, I believe these are good men and everything, but I personally believe they are. these are two different kingdoms. I, I mean, I know sometimes some, some words can... It can be referring to the same thing and just says it says it differently but i mean i i feel like and i I truly believe according to the bible that it calls it the kingdom of god and the kingdom of heaven for a reason i believe that it it names them different for a reason i believe these are different kingdoms and i understand they're sometimes used interchangeably but that's because sometimes they're both present at the same time for example when jesus christ was here on earth when you're reading about him in the Gospels, they were both here. So he uses them interchangeably. When he is here in the millennium, they are both here. See, right now, we are operating under the kingdom of God. It's a spiritual kingdom. And the Bible shows us that in Romans 14, 17. It says, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. So you see how there it's not physical things, but it's spiritual things. It's not physical, it's spiritual. Now, the kingdom of heaven is different because the kingdom of heaven is physical, has to do with physical things. Matthew eleven twelve it says, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. So you see how that's a physical thing. It suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. The kingdom of heaven has more to do with the physical nation of Israel. The kingdom of God has more to do with the church. Right now, we aren't concerned with bringing in a physical kingdom. We know that God's going to bring in his kingdom at the second coming, and we look forward to that. But right now, we are more concerned with getting people into the kingdom of God by believing the gospel, and then they can also come back with Jesus Christ when he sets up his physical kingdom. But our focus is on the spiritual things, getting them saved, not setting up a kingdom right now. We know that some things have to happen, and Jesus Christ has to come back himself to set up the kingdom. I can't set up a kingdom, a physical kingdom on earth for the Lord right now with physical weapons. That's what they were trying to do in the Old Testament. See, in the New Testament, it's changed. We're focusing on a spiritual kingdom. The kingdom of heaven has to do with physical weapons, but the kingdom of God has to do with spiritual weapons, the word of God. In 2 Corinthians 10, 4, Paul says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, meaning they're not worldly, they're not of this world, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Paul said in Ephesians 6, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Our fight is a spiritual fight, not so much a physical fight. But when you're reading the Bible, keeping in mind which kingdom is in operation during the certain scripture you are reading is really going to clear up a lot of stuff for you. Because the kingdom of heaven has more to do with physical things but the kingdom of God is about spiritual things, and that's the kingdom that you're operating in, the kingdom of God. Now, another thing, consider Israel versus the church. When you're reading the Bible, consider Israel versus the church. If you get Israel and the church mixed up, you will have prophecy all mixed up. I don't care if you've got the Bible memorized and you know the Bible be so much better than everybody else. If you've got Israel and the church mixed up, you're, you've got a lot of things mixed up. It says in Romans eleven twenty five through 28, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery. See, this is a mystery. Lest ye should be wise in your own conceits. 
that blindness in part has happened to Israel and to the fullness of the Gentiles become in. You know how Israel rejected Jesus Christ. They had that. We saw their, their last rejection in Acts 7 with the, with the stoning of Stephen. Ever since then, they're blind in part. Some of them get saved, but for the most part, as a whole, Israel is blind to the gospel. They have no idea what the gospel is. They don't, they, they reject it. And so all, it says, and so all Israel shall be saved. If you're replacing Israel with the church, then you're saying the church isn't saved because it says, and so all Israel shall be saved. I'm currently saved now. I'm not waiting to be saved. So to say that I'm Israel makes no sense. It says, as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. I'm a born again believer. When it comes to my standing in Jesus Christ, my ungodliness has already been taken away. I am not Jacob. I am a born again believer in the church, which is the body of Christ. But this says, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. It, God's not done with Israel. He's talking about Jacob. Jacob is Israel. That's why they're called the children of Israel. It says, for this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. So if you're Israel, then do you not have your sins taken away? It says, when I shall take away their sins. My sins are already taken away. This isn't referring to me. This is referring to Israel and showing you that God is not done with Israel because he's about to do something with them in the future. And it says, as concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. So if, if I'm Israel, am I an enemy to the gospel? But as touching the election, they're beloved for the father's sakes. The fathers, meaning Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So that's the balanced view in the Jew. Concerning the gospel, they're an enemy because they reject it. They don't believe Jesus Christ is God. But as touching the election, they are beloved. They're beloved enemies. The church did not replace Israel. And Romans 11 made it very clear. But throughout the Old Testament, God was dealing with the nation of Israel. The church, which is the body of Christ, hadn't even started yet. Recognizing this is a huge key. The saints in the Old Testament, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, Moses, they were not put into the church, which is the body of Christ. That hadn't even started yet. I mean, Paul said in Ephesians that he might reconcile in one, both in one body by the cross. I mean, the way to get into the body wasn't even made possible until Jesus died on the cross. So how could they have been put in the body in the Old Testament? Recognizing that's a huge key to get the most out of your Bible study. When the Jews rejected Jesus Christ after his death, burial, and resurrection, God began dealing primarily with the Gentiles in the church. Jews still get saved, but during this time, when someone gets saved, they become neither Jew nor Gentile. But back there in the Old Testament, it was all about, oh, were you Israel or were you not a, a part of Israel? In the, in the uh, book of Revelation, you read, a big emphasis on Israel. You got 144,000 Jews. It's pointing out. It's pointing out that they're Jews. Male Jewish virgins. 144,000 tribulation saints. Male Jewish virgins. In Revelation 7 and Revelation 14. It makes an emphasis on them being Jews. But in, the, in this time we're in. The Bible says in Galatians 3.28, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. When you get saved, it's not about are you a Jew or a Gentile. It's about are you saved, are you in the body of Christ. But in, in Revelation, in the tribulation period, it's going back to God dealing with the Jews, and that emphasis is placed back on Israel. God isn't dealing with Israel primarily right now, but this doesn't mean we have replaced Israel because God will once again deal with the Jews in Daniel's 70th week, the time of Jacob's trouble, as Jeremiah calls it, what people refer to as the tribulation. 
And this shows that the church isn't going through the tribulation because it is Jacob's trouble, not the church's trouble. Also, all of the sign gifts, you know, like the charismatics try to do today, the speaking in tongues, the healing, the signs, and the wonders, all those things are for Israel. And if you recognize there's a difference between Israel and the church, then this will help you not to be confused by speaking in tongues and the charismatic movement. Because 1 Corinthians one twenty two says, For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. 1 Corinthians 14.22 says, Wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. So we know the signs of an apostle, speaking in tongues, being able to drink any deadly thing, being able to be bit by a serpent and it not hurt you. All those were signs that God gave the apostles so that they could confirm the word being preached to unbelieving Jews. Just like Moses confirmed the word to Israel with the signs that he had. We don't require a sign. We are not the Jews. We're not Israel. Recognizing a difference between the church and Israel will really help you with your Bible study. Now, some other things. What to do while you read. When you read the Bible, you need to read it with a specific purpose. For example, when you read a chapter, read it with the purpose of writing a short summary or sentence or paragraph about the chapter. And if you do that, then you know you will have to keep your full attention on that chapter or your mind will just drift off. The next thing, pick a chapter a week. Read the, read the chapter every day. Study it every day. Cross-reference it every day. Listen to some commentary or read some commentary on it every day. Write down what it means to you and how you can apply it practically to your life. And this may be a long process, but just think about it. If you did one New, Ch New Testament chapter a week, it would only take you five years to do the whole New Testament that way. If you're 70 years old and you think you're too late, it's not far-fetched far -fetched that you would live to be 80 and then by that time, you could have the whole New Testament done and a good portion of the Old Testament before you go home to heaven. I mean, a chapter a week, you're spending that much time on it, you're going to know it pretty well. And if you do that every week for 10 years, you're going to know a lot of Bible. You're going to have a really good understanding of your Bible in the next 10 years if you do that. Also, if you take a topic a week, Study really thoroughly a topic a week. Imagine how much more of Bible you're going to know in 10 years. Imagine how much better your understanding will be in 10 years if you simply take a topic a week, a chapter a week, read some verses every day for the rest of your Christian life. At least, maybe, at least read three to five chapters a day. Imagine how much more of an understanding you're going to have and how much more you'll get out of your Bible study if you will just do these simple things that I've showed you. And I have videos about each of these topics I've gave you. I've got tons of videos just about the types, finding Jesus in the Old Testament. I've got tons of videos about the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of heaven. I've got uh, videos about uh, recognizing uh, the different covenants. If you want to learn this stuff more thoroughly, <clears throat> I have the series on God's Game of Thrones where, you know, they got that wicked TV show called Game of Thrones, and I kind of just show you how the world just takes the things of God and tries to make their own show out of it, but the Bible is about thrones and kingdoms, and I explain to you the difference about the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven, and I show you the covenants and how people are chasing a throne throughout the Bible, and that could help you further understand the Bible, <clears throat> and if you're further interested and want to know more, just send me an email and I'll give you some material of all types of other teachers that will really help you with your Bible study.